His Holiness Radnath Maharaj will be coming a little later, and he'll also be speaking. Uh, he's at another program, so he'll be here very shortly. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Virasesha Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you all for coming. Today is actually the uh, beginning of the winter season. It's called Makara Sankranti. Today is the day that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took the renounced daughter of life, accepted sannyas, gave up his <clears throat> comfortable situation with his, in the village with his elders and with his wife, his lovely and loving mother, surrounded by so many well-wishing friends, and took the great austerity of sacrificing in order to teach eternal religious principles. So today is Makara Sankranti. It's the day that Lord Chaitanya accepted sannyas. It's also the, the disappearance day of one of the uh, greatest of all Vaishnav poets, songwriters, Srila Jayadev Goswami. It's the day that he disappeared from this world. And it's also the day of another great Vaishnava, Sri Lochan Das Thakur, who is the author of one of the biographies of the life of Lord Chaitanya called Chaitanya Mangala, which was one of the most accepted and uh, what we say authoritative works on the teachings of Lord Chaitanya, the life of Lord Chaitanya taken from the notes of Sri Murari Gupta, an intimate and an eternal associate of Lord Chaitanya, who was there while writing his diary, and Lord Chaitanya was also participating in the pastimes with Lord Chaitanya. So today is a very, what we say, auspicious day. <laughs> Actually, every day is auspicious. Why? Because every day is a great opportunity to render devotional service to the Lord, mm -hmm. which is the eternal nature of the jiva. The living entity's existence is situated on its innate nature. Our nature is to love and serve God. Mm -hmm. That is our nature. We have a second nature, that is our nature in this world, to take care of this body to take care of the extensions of the body in terms of family members and others, and to adhere to certain social and political principles that govern the jurisdiction of living in the state. But these are all extraneous to our real goal of life. They are just necessities. Our real business is to awaken our love for Krishna. <laughs> in fact, the scriptures say that it's the only business of the living entity and that business solves all problems. One love of Krishna is a present within the heart of the living being, then all of one's desires are completely and perfectly fulfilled. Not just completely, but perfect, in a perfect way. Love is the essence of all emotions and when that love is directed towards the Supreme Lord it finds complete fulfillment and happiness eternally. <clears throat> so therefore this world is simply meant as an opportunity to get back to our real nature is to love and serve God. 
the great souls who have gone before us, they teach by example, they teach by their words, and by what they leave behind, actually, how to serve the Lord, and what of the eternal religious principles that govern service to the Lord. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit about, about Jayadev Goswami. Uh, probably maybe some of you are not aware of Srila Jayadev Goswami, but he appeared 600 years actually before the appearance of Lord Chaitanya. So we say, might say over 1100 years ago, Srila Jayadev Goswami appeared. There's some, what we say, unclear information about where he appeared. The most authoritative, he played, appeared in a place called Kendu Bilvala. It's in the district of Orissa, in that area. Others say he came from South India. That is not as much accepted. Um, he was a Grihasta. He was married. And him and his wife, Padmavati, actually his, his father's name was Boja Devi, Boja De Deva, actually Boja Deva. His mother's name was Vama Devi. Uh, he was born in a Vaishnav family at that time. That was before the appearance of Lord Chaitanya. And uh, at a very young age, he took to worship of the Lord and also was going to take the, what we say, lifelong vow of celibacy. But his mind was changed by circumstances and he decided to accept marriage. And that's a very long story. It's an interesting story. The details I'm not so familiar with, but he entered the Grihastha life and he had a wonderful wife named Padmavati who was practically on the same level of devotion that he was. Both were great souls and they worshipped the Lord in their form of the deity called Madhava. Their deity's name was Radha Madhava. We sing Jaya Dev Goswami Prandana He Jaya Dev Goswami Prandana He Jaya Radha Madhava Radha Madhava Radhe Jaya Radha Radha a beautiful prayer describing the different great souls and the deities they worship. So Jayadev Goswami is very much connected with Sri Sri Radha Madhava. And that was his worshipful deity. There's one beautiful story, actually. One day he was on the roof of fixing his house. and It's really hot in the, the month of Jaist, very hot month. And he was still doing some repairs. And you know, the roofs are very hot sometimes, tin roofs. And he was really struggling hard. And he was working. And Krishna took compassion on him and decided to assist him. So he started to hand him. He was putting these little tiles on the roof so to make the roof stronger. And Krishna started to handing him the tiles while he was working. He was so absorbed in doing his work that he didn't even know who was handing him. First he thought it was his wife handing him the titles. So he just kept working. But after he was done, he turned around and there was nobody there. <laughs> Krishna had disappeared. And then later on, he was thinking, who is that? I thought it was my wife. He went to ask her. She didn't come out of the house. And then he realized actually Krishna had come but it was his deity, Shishi Radha Madhava, who manifested himself in the form of mercy just to help his devotee. Of course, to take service from the Lord is not sound very pleasing for a devotee. A devotee likes to give the Lord service, not to 
take service from the Lord. There's a beautiful story in the life of Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami, where it was Sanatan Goswami's birthday. And they were living as mendicants. They had nothing. They were living under trees, practically, with begging, getting a little bit of, you know, chipped rice and some chickpeas, some atta, mixing it with Ganges water, making some chapatis. Very simple life. So Rupa Goswami was thinking, it's my birthday, it's my brother's birthday. I should give him something, but I don't have anything. And he was thinking, what can I do? So while he was in that mood, uh, this young little girl, beautiful little girl, came along with a basket full of rice and dal and sugar, and she had milk with her, and so many things. And she said, hey, Baba. <laughs> I got something for you. I know you're in need. Here, take. He was thinking, this is so nice. And he saw the girl, didn't recognize her at first. And then he took, and he was so happy. And that day he cooked nice prashad, offered it, and brought it to his brother that evening. Sanatana Goswami was very happy to receive such a loving offering from his younger brother, Rupa Goswami. But then, after he was tasting it, he started to think, where did this come from? This is extraordinarily tasty. And then he started, then he realized, and he said to Rupa Goswami, where did you get this? We have nothing. We're living like beggars. How did you come up with all this to cook? He said, I was just praying, praying, how can I serve you on your birthday? And all of a sudden, this Little girl, she came along with this basket full of so many nice things. And that's how I got it. He said, what girl? What did she look like? And then he started to describe her. Oh, this is not good. You have taken service from Srimati Radharani. We are meant to serve Radharani. We don't want to take service. But you know, Krishna likes to serve his devotees. And devotees like to serve Krishna. And you know who wins? Krishna. <laughs> he never loses. <laughs> mm -hmm. Only he, the only time he ever loses is when he's with Radharani. She wins sometimes. <laughs> but devotee can't serve the Lord as good as the Lord can serve the devotee. Because the Lord is more equipped in all aspects. Although he's the master, he likes to serve. That's, that's the beauty of the Lord. Of course, we don't want to take service from the Lord because the devotee is embarrassed. But sometimes when we want to serve the Lord, and we're thinking, I need this to serve, somehow, just by some inconsequential, you might say, or some un foreseeable arrangement, things just appear. <laughs> and all of a sudden the service is there. <laughs> That's the nature of the Lord. He always makes things nice for his devotees so the devotee can serve. So Jayadev Goswami, he, he didn't want to take, when he realized it was his own deity, Sri Sri Radha Madhava, who actually incarnated to come and assist him. He, fell before his deity and offered wonderful prayers and apologized to the Lord. And the Lord was very happy to serve his devotee. One day him and his wife were, were serving the deity so nicely and all of a sudden Radha and Madhava started to merge together and became one. And they turned into this beautiful form of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And then the Lord, in that form, started to speak to both of them. He said, I, you have both served me with such love and devotion for so many years, sacrificing everything simply for my comfort and my pleasure. I just want to somehow reciprocate. And then the Lord explained that actually I will be coming in about so many hundreds of years in the future 
and I will come in this wonderful form to teach the essence of devotional service, loving service in Sri Vrindavan Dham to Radha and Krishna in this beautiful form. So the Lord, Lord Chaitanya actually appeared to both of them and explained that his, of his mission, his mission was Harinam Sankirtan, to glorify the Lord by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. The Lord comes, inaugurates the, the Sankirtan movement for himself, and he also teaches it. He teaches it, he inaugurates it, and he performs it. So after this wonderful vision, their hearts really became more and more enlivened in devotional service. Jayadev Goswami is interesting. He's a forerunner in teaching Radha Bhava, the love of Radharani, which was pretty much not there at the time. People were worshipping Krishna mostly. And the other sampradayas, especially the, the Madhva Sampradaya and the other Sampradayas really didn't have a clear understanding of Radharani's position. Some thought she was just some Apsara who had appeared during the time of Krishna. <laughs> Her position was not clear in the other Sampradayas and some didn't acknowledge her worship and some uh, simply thought it was, she was just an expansion, she's just a Shakti. But she is the original source of all female manifestations. And she is the source of the Lakshmis, the Gopis, the Queens, and even the wives of the demigods also. <laughs> and she is the source of all manifestations of the female energy to appear in different forms to simply to give pleasure to Krishna in his different forms as Narayan or Vishnu, like that. So one day, Jayadev Goswami was writing in his book. He wrote this famous book, one book we're not supposed to read. It's banned. <laughs> it's called Gita Govinda. Srila Prabhupada says, it is way, way beyond our ability to appreciate and to understand. He said, do not glorify or speak about Gita Govinda. Do not read it because Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu only would read that in the company of his private and intimate disciples in the very last years of his stay on this earth very intimate association of Radha and Krishna in Vrindavan. But it was written by, Gita, by Jayadev Goswami and Lord Chaitanya would listen to that, the teachings or the, the words of Jayadev Goswami's writings from his, the mouth of his two most intimate disciples, Srila Ramananda Roy and Srub Damodar Goswami would both speak the poetry of Chandidas, Jayadev Goswami, Vidyapati, and others. And they appeared all before the appearance of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And so, in this poet, in this, while he was writing this glorification, he kept glorifying the gopis' love for Krishna. And that the gopis' love for Krishna is so exalted that Krishna becomes subservient to that love. <laughs> As he was writing, he came, he came to this one verse. He, like, he thought of this one verse which said, Dehi Pada Palava Maduram. And the actual translation is that Lord Sri Krishna puts his head at the lotus feet of Srimati Radharani. And then while he was writing, he was thinking, this is not right. How can I write this? Krishna is not subordinate to anybody. And I'm thinking like this, 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 this doesn't... As he was glorifying the gopis' love for Krishna, he came across this exalted, what we say, inspiration to write this. But then he thought, it's not right. It's just not right. And then he wanted to write some more, but nothing came. So he put his pen down, 
he said to his wife, Padmavati, I'm going to the Ganga, take bath, I'll be back after some time. So it was time for her to offer the, the prasadam to the deity. She did that while he was gone. But Krishna did something. He disguised himself as Jayadev. Came into the house of Jayadev Goswami in the form of Jayadev. He walked in. He went right over to his book. And Krishna wrote that verse, that line, Dehi Pada Palava Maduram. And he wrote other things. And then he said to Padmavati, she couldn't recognize her husband in the form of Krishna. It was Krishna in the form of Jayadev. When Krishna wants to do something, you can't... If Krishna wants to hide, you can't not find him. <laughs> you will not find him. Whatever Krishna wants to do, it's perfect. So she couldn't recognize her own husband. It was actually her husband, and, but it was Krishna in that form. So he took the prasadam that she had offered, left some remnants, and then he left. And she took the remnants. And while after he left, he disappeared. And then the real Jayadev came in. He said to his wife, I'm hungry. She said, hmm, you just had prasad. <laughs> she said, no, he said, don't joke. <laughs> she said, yeah, you just came in, you wrote in your book, and then you came, and I just saw, served you. And here's the remnants. Go look in your book. She went, he went in his book, and the ink was still wet. He was writing on these palm leaves with this ink, and it was still wet yet. And, could, and he saw that line, Dehi Balava Maduram. And then he realized, because he was such a deep, deep devotee of the Lord. He had such realization. And by his realization, he could understand that Krishna came and did it. And then he said to Padmavati, as he was overwhelmed with emotion, his eyes were full of tears, his heart was full of gratefulness, he said to his wife, you are so fortunate. You actually took the, the direct remnants of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna himself. Imagine that. Of course, we do it every day. That's called Mahaprasadam. <laughs> but when, if Krishna personally comes into your house, sits down, has a plate of, you know, I don't know, pizza? No, no, not pizza. <laughs> no pizza. I don't know if Krishna likes pizza, but of course we have pizza in the restaurant there. Yeah. <laughs> so it must be a little bit Vedic, right? Actually, everything's Vedic. The whole world is Vedic, except it's got off track a little bit. <laughs> it's true. Everything is coming from the Vedic culture. <laughs> Western culture is simply some offshoot, <laughs> that's all. So, you know, he had, he saw such great fortune. He was glorifying his wife, Padmapati, for having such opportunities to serve the Lord and take the Lord's remnants. Jayadev Goswami was an interesting person. He wrote Das Avatar. We sing it every day, you know. The, we sing one prayer every day. Tava Kara Kamala Vare Naka Adbuta Sringha Dalita Hiranya Kashi Bhutanu Bringa Kesavadrita <laughs> Hai Bhagavadhi Sahadhi Hai Bhagavadhi Sahadhi Hai Bhagavadhi Sahadhi That's one of ten verses glorifying the different Leela avatars of the Lord. Matsya, Kurma, Varahadev, Nishringadev, 
Vamanadev, uh, Brigupati, uh, Parasuram, also Rama, Balaram, Buddha, and ultimately Kolki Avatar. These are the beautiful songs written by Jayadev Goswami. So one king, his name was Lakshman Singh, his uh, court scholar, he had a copy, Jayadev had written that copy, and he showed it to the king. When the king read that, he said, amazing, this is amazing bhakti. He was so overwhelmed with love and appreciation. He said, where can I meet this personality? He lives in this village not far from here. So the king decided to meet Jayadev. So he, just, he dressed himself up as a devotee, a simple devotee. And he came in disguised. And then he went to see Jayadev. He said, I, I have read this beautiful poem, song you have read. It's so beautiful. Jayadev said, who are you? He said, you can't tell a lie to a great soul. You get stuck. You don't do that. And he didn't know what to say. He didn't want to reveal himself as the king, but he couldn't lie at the same time. He said, I'm King Lakshman Sain. He said, but please don't become upset. I, can't, I just wanted to meet you. You're such a great devotee. You inspired me so much. Please stay in my kingdom and I'll... Just build you a beautiful, beautiful place to stay, and you could write and do your poetry, your bhajan. Jayadev was a little upset because the king had tricked him. He said, "You're just a sense gratifier. Fire. You're just a king, and your only business is to, you know, do politics, you know, and we don't mix with such personalities." So actually. I'm going to leave. <laughs> I'm going to go to Jagannath Puri. I don't want to stay here anymore. The king, you know, he was criticized by Jayadev. And, you know, kings have false egos. <laughs> you see, to be a king, you have to be kind of like a little, you know, assertive in your way of doing things. He wasn't at all offended. In fact, his heart was somewhat purified by Jayadev's chastisement. And so he just became more humble and offered more prayers and said, I promise you, I'll build you a nice little hut in Champak Hatta. There's a little place, there's a Champak Far. It's a beautiful place for doing bhajan. You can stay there and I'll never come to see you. I'll just, I won't bother you. Just please stay in my kingdom for the benefit of others. And Jayadev actually said, actually, I was just testing you. <laughs> and I can see you're actually a wonderful devotee. So I will stay in your kingdom. And at the same time, you may also come and visit from time to time. <laughs> he was very merciful. So he did. He stayed there for some time. But later on, when Lord Chaitanya appeared to him, Lord Chaitanya told him, you have to leave. You have to go to Mayapur and stay. And not Mamsar, not Mayapur, but Jagannath Puri. Go to Jagannath Puri and reside there. And him and his wife didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay in the area of Navadweep in Champakata. And they were just thinking, how can we leave this place? Lord Chaitanya will appear in so many years. This is a very special place. It will be the Janmastan of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord appeared and said, actually, I'll perform my later pastimes in Jagannath Puri, so please go. So what can they say? And they said, Lord Chaitanya said to him, actually, you told the king you were going to go to Jagannath Puri anyway. So you're simply keeping your promise. <laughs> and so he did. They were... They, actually, they were dragging their feet, as they say. You know, when you have to do something, and you don't want to do it, but you know you have to do it. You ever find yourself in that situation every day? <laughs> it's, it's like living in this world. Oh, I got to work for this guy again. I got to do this again. I got to do that again. Oh, God. I just want to chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> 
It's like, you know, life can be a burden. It is, it's a lot of responsibilities that are placed upon us. We have to struggle with that. So we drag our feet sometimes. But then Lord Jagannath came and Lord Jagannath actually appeared to them and said, actually, I want you to come to uh, my home in Puri and I want you to write beautiful, beautiful songs and poetry. And they did. He did. He actually went. And there's some of the poetry that Jayadev Goswami writes. They still sing today at Lord Jagannath in the evening. So we have a message here? Yes. Ah, okay, wonderful. So, Radhanath Maharaj's brother, younger brother Larry, is among us today. And so we will welcome him. Well, please, all the devotees, welcome the brother of Radhanath Maharaj, Larry Prabhu. Thank you for coming, Larry. Hare Krishna. Thank you. So today is the disappearance day of Srila Jayadev Goswami. Actually, appearance and disappearance are explained by the Acharyas as being something that is seen by us. <laughs> Great souls appear, don't really appear and disappear. They go from place to place simply to do the same thing. And what is that? to teach eternal religious principles. They always exist somewhere doing the same thing. Disappearance and appearance is just like the sun rises in the morning, the sun sets in the evening. At one time it's not there, and then it is there, and then it again disappears. But from our angle of vision, that's called appearance and disappearance. But the sun is always somewhere. It doesn't appear and disappear. And we're just seeing it from our own angle. So great souls, they come on behalf of the Lord to teach eternal religious principles to the conditioned souls. Simply to awaken or inspire us in devotional service. That's why in Krishna consciousness, in Vaishnav culture, there's a practically every day, there's a celebration to honor the Lord, to honor the Lord's great devotees. And this, this gives happiness, this gives satisfaction, this gives peace of mind to the heart, to the mind. People in this world are glorifying somebody. We're either glorifying politicians, successful business people, movie stars, somebody who has done something outstanding by material calculations. So it's natural to want to look up to someone and be inspired by that person, to say nice things, to speak about their deeds. But we find that doesn't really give us real satisfaction. When we, satis when we glorify the Lord, because we are connected to the Lord, we actually find satisfaction. It's like when you, we hear that old, not old, but common sta statement that when you water the root of the tree, the flowers, the fruits, the branches, the twigs, everything in connected with the root becomes benefited by the watering process. Simply to glorify the Lord means to awaken happiness and satisfaction within the heart. And what is even more important than glorifying the Lord is to glorify the Lord's devotees. To glorify or to hear glorification is equal. Don't think that if you hearing is less than speaking. Actually, it, they are equally the same. They are equally the same. 
in the sense that one who is glorifying the Lord and one who is hearing the glories of the Lord both find satisfaction in that exchange. So there's nothing, and that is the essence, really, of spiritual life. Satatam kirtayan toma yatantasta tetad vitaha yatantasta timam bhaktya nitya yukta upasate. Always chanting my glories, bowing down before me, worship me with great devotion. These souls perpetually, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, worship with the great devotion. Constantly. This is the mood of one who is understanding the essence of life, is to hear and chant the glories of the Lord. So today is the disappearance day of Srila Jayadev Goswami. As I explained, disappearance and appearance, similar. The only difference between appearance and disappearance, from our perspective, is that when they appear, we don't know so much. But when they disappear, they leave behind so much that we can benefit from. So we might actually say that disappearance is considered to be, in one sense, more, not glorifiable, but more of a celebration. More of a celebration in the sense that they're going somewhere else to do the same thing and their life has become successful. That success is that he inspire us in devotional service. Today also is another disappearance, Lochan Das Thakur, an intimate associate of Lord Chaitanya's intimate associate, Srila Narahari Sakar. He wrote the biography, Lochan Das Thakur, called Chaitanya Mangala, of the life of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Which in that biography, so many details of Lord Chaitanya's life is explained in such, what we say, beautiful, beautiful poetic expressions. It's, one of the, it's a masterpiece of spiritual glorification, the life of of Lord Chaitanya given by Lord Chantas Thakur. Chaitanya Mangala, actually Vrindavan Das Thakur, he entitled his book Chaitanya Mangala. But then when he heard Lord Chantas also had the same name, he changed it to Chaitanya Bhagwan. So we have Chaitanya Bhagwan, Chaitanya Mangala, and Chaitanya Chari Tamrita. And of course we as, and in the ISKCON society, Srila Prabhupada has given us Chaitanya Charitamrita by Srila Krishna Das Gaviraj Goswami. All are all powerful glorifications of the Lord. But in the Chaitanya Mangala, there's a beautiful, beautiful part in the very introduction where is explained why Lord Chaitanya appeared for his intimate own transcendental happiness. He was, Krishna was in Dwarka. Krishna resides in Dwarka as Dwarkanath or Dwarkadish. He's the king of Dwarka. After he left Vrindavan, he went to Mathura for a while, took care of Kamsa, performed some other activities, established Ugrasena on the throne. And then later, he resided in Dwarka when the residents of Mathura were being attacked by the demons headed by Jarasandha. The Lord created this place called Dwarka. And he moved all his residents, all his eternal associates, to the island of Dwarka. And he resided there as a king with 16,108 palaces and queens. And as, hmm, lost my train of thought, Dwarka, it's connected with Dwarka. Can't remember now, what was I saying? can figure it out. A 
Krishna, uh, Krishna created that in, in Dwarka. Okay. Can't remember. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. It's, it's by your meditation it came through. <laughs> And he was there, and Rukmini was his principal queen, and she was massaging his feet, and she was overwhelmed with devotion. Her devotion was just pouring from her mind and her heart, and she was shedding tears. And she was explaining, or expressing, that your lotus feet are so wonderful. Nothing can compare to your lotus feet. The lotus feet of the Lord are considered to be the treasure of all great souls. One aspires for devotion by aspiring for the lotus feet of the Lord, to think of the lotus feet of the Lord, to meditate on the lotus feet of the Lord, to want to serve the lotus feet of the Lord. The lotus feet of the Lord represents all success in devotional service. The chanting of the holy names takes us to the lotus feet of the Lord. It's the essence. And she was just glorifying Krishna's lotus feet in a very emotional way. And then she said, your lotus feet are so wonderful that you don't even know how wonderful they are. <laughs> you're so wonderful that you don't even know your own wonder. And then she went on to say that actually there's only one person in existence that knows how wonderful your lotus feet is. And Krishna was thinking, hmm, I don't even know how wonderful I am. Because <laughs> you shouldn't think like that. You may be wonderful too, but don't try to imitate that. <laughs> but Krishna can do that and there's no false pride because he's God. <laughs> he doesn't change positions. We, we're always changing our position. <laughs> so, and then she said, it is Srimati Radharani. And the Lord was thinking, only Radharani knows. So he decided from that experience to actually understand his own glories by becoming, or coming into the mood of Srimati Radharani. So the appearance of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is actually the appearance of Krishna in the mood of Srimati Radharani, wanting to taste the happiness that Radharani tastes in her love for, for Krishna, and to experience that love, and to understand the qualities of, of Krishna's glories. So only Radharani knows these. She only knows that happiness, that bhakti, that love, and uh, Krishna's glories. So Lord Chaitanya in that, or Krishna, took the form of Lord Chaitanya. And that's explained in the very beginning of Chaitanya Mangala, how that whole thing manifested. So how glorious this writing is. Lord Chandas, he got married at a very young age, very young age, and left home right after that. And then he met his spiritual master, um, Narahari Sakar, and he was living as a brahmachari in the, ha in the ashram of Narahari Sakar for many years. But he had left his wife, who was just a child when they got married. He wasn't at all, when we say, interested in that. And he was living as a brahmachari, but he really wasn't a brahmachari. He got married at a young age and left. And then one person who actually knew him and knew his wife from the village, now she was much older, he came and he, he said to Narahari Sakar, this man, he's working, he's your disciple, but actually he's a grihasta and his wife is in the village and she's been living without a husband. Because it's understood, that, you know, in Vedic culture, you get married once. <laughs> Welcome to the new India, right? <laughs> Trying to catch up to the West. Anyway, well, that's another story, but, you know. That's actually real 
chastity. Of course, that's a, that's a debatable thing nowadays. What is real chastity in terms of what is success in life? They seem to clash, <laughs> success and chastity. But anyway, she was living with her parents, without a husband, wondering where her husband went for many years. So Narahari, when he heard about Lochanda, that he had actually been married, he sent him back. He said, you go back to the village and you go with your wife and you stay there. So he left at the, at the instructions of his spiritual master. And then he was thinking, he didn't even know what his wife was looking, looked like. So he was walking in that village, didn't know exactly what house it was. He saw this young lady drawing water from the well. He said to her, Mataji, can you, and he had the names, can you direct me to where this place is? And she directed him, she was very, very shy. And then he went, and then later on it was revealed that that was his wife. <laughs> She was the one that was drawing water. He didn't even recognize her. So, as a dutiful servant of his spiritual master, he decided to follow that instruction, and he took up Grihastha life again. But he wasn't good at it. <laughs> he would just sit and read Bhagavatam all day. <laughs> it can be pretty boring for ladies if you're just reading Bhagavatam, unless you're doing the same thing. But she was not so much inspired, but she was trying to follow her. And then she saw him after so many days, he was living with her and he, he just didn't have the propensity, the tendency, the attraction for household life. She said, go back to your spiritual master and live with him. You are a brahmachari. <laughs> and so he did, he did. So this is a little bit about the life of Lochan Das Thakur. Please read that book, Chaitanya Mangala, if you haven't read it. It opens up so many beautiful, beautiful details in the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya. Especially Lord Chaitanya's marriage. That, that is described in, I think, in the utmost detail, even more than in Chaitanya Bhagavat. And definitely, it's not hardly even mentioned in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Lord Chaitanya taking sannyas. Today is the actual anniversary celebration of Lord Chaitanya taking sannyas. There are many, many beautiful chapters which describe Lord Chaitanya taking sannyas. How he led, what led him step by step to finally revealing what his desire was to take the sannyas order of life. It wasn't easy for Lord Chaitanya to reveal that to his devotees especially to his mother and his good wife, Vishnu Priya. But he did, slowly, making sure he was ultimately doing it in the most gentle and sensitive way he could possibly do it, but at the same time, there was no other way. He had to take sannyas, knowing that everyone would be devastated. There's a beautiful pastime where in the house of Sri Vastakur, Lord Chaitanya would dance every night and perform wonderful kirtan with his devotees. And one night during the kirtan, actually it wasn't even the night, it was just at the beginning of the evening when the kirtan began, Sri Vastakur's son died. Probably you've all heard the story. The boy was only four years old. The ladies in the house, the family members were so overwhelmed with unhappiness about this child dying untimely, so they were crying. Srivas came into the room and says, why are you crying? They said, your son has just died. He didn't really respond to that. He just said, please don't cry so loud. Lord Chaitanya is dancing, you'll, you'll disturb his kirtan. So he was more concerned that Lord Chaitanya would be happy chanting, dancing, than the calamity in the house. And so the kirtan went on for hours. They, were, they continued. And about seven and a half hours later, Lord Chaitanya said to Srivas, he stopped the kirtan abruptly. And he said, 
Srivas, is there some calamity in this house? Some misfortune? I'm not feeling very comfortable. I can understand something is wrong. And Srivas Thakur said, what could be wrong? You're here, you're with all your devotees, we're having kirtan. But since you asked, your son died. My son died. Oh, when? About seven and a half hours ago. Where is he? Let's go see. So they took him into the other room. The boy was laying. The ladies were still there, mourning. Lord Chaitanya walked up to the boy, put his hand on the boy's chest, and said, where have you gone? The boy rose up. He, everyone was shocked. He came back to life. He sat up. He looked at the Lord. He said, my dear Lord, I'm your eternal servant. I come into this world by your arrangement, and by your arrangement I'm leaving. By your arrangement I'm leaving. The boy spoke pure transcendental philosophy, and then he just lay down and died again. <laughs> and everyone, when they, everyone heard, their minds were somewhat pacified. And Lord Chaitanya was so grateful and so appreciative of Srivast Thakur's devotion that he was willing to do anything for the Lord's happiness, even at the expense of his family, that the Lord performed the last rites of the child himself and took the body down to the Ganga and performed the last rites with all the family members. He did everything. He arranged everything just to show his love for his devotee. That's Lord Chaitanya. How kind he is. That's mentioned in, in uh, Lochantas Thakur's writings, that the mercy of Lord Chaitanya is the complete mercy of the Lord. And if one wants to understand how merciful Lord Chaitanya is, or how merciful God is, one should understand the life of Lord Chaitanya. No one will understand greater mercy anywhere. And of course, that understanding always falls short of the actual mercy. <laughs> Prabhupada gave an analogy. What is the mercy of Lord Chaitanya? He said, I come up to you. I am your friend. I want to give you something. Just say, I want to give you some money. So I have some rupees, maybe a thousand rupees. So I say, here, here's, this is for you. And you say, oh, thank you very much. I don't really need it, but thank you for the gesture. You keep it. No, no, I want to give it to you. No, thank you very much, but no. So you refuse, but the giver, the donor, takes it and pushes it in your pocket and says, don't take it out. <laughs> he says, that's Lord Chaitanya. That's Lord Chaitanya. He's forcing his mercy by his kindness. Just like sometimes Prabhupada says, you know, many, many people from India, they go to the West. Why do you go to the West? Bhakti Siddhanta says, Indians go to the West for two reasons. To preach and for sense gratification. And I think the second reason is more prominent. <laughs> Not too many people go to the West to preach <laughs> from India. But when they go to, to the West and they're looking for jobs and nice apartments and nice things, they meet the devotees. Lord Chaitanya is there and he traps them. Ah, you think you're getting away, huh? I'm here also. <laughs> and if you go to another country, I'm also there. <laughs> can't get away. So Lord Chaitanya is everywhere in the world, even in China and Bali and some of the most remote places of the world, you'll find deities of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda together. That's mercy. You can't get away. <laughs> so those of you who are thinking of getting away, you can't. <laughs> so that's the mercy. And the mercy is that we have a little desire, and the Lord takes that desire and just brings it to full perfection. So.
So that's explained by Srila Nochan Das Thakur in the Chaitanya Mangala. And Prabhupada actually concludes by saying that no one can really understand Lord Chaitanya's mercy. It's impossible to understand. He's made the most unqualified qualified. He's given the highest to those who have no sukriti, no anything. He's giving everyone a chance to chant the holy names of the Lord, to perfect their life, purify themselves, and to go back home, back to Godhead. That's Lord Chaitanya's mercy. It's impossible to understand, and he's very active in distributing. It says he broke open the storehouse of love of God. He smashed the doors, the walls, the, the windows, he tore the whole storehouse apart and distributed the contents completely everywhere to everyone at all times. And it's easy. Lord Chaitanya's mercy is simple. Do two things. That's all. Two and a half. No, two, three things. Three things. I, you know, I, it's actually two things, but the third thing is nice also. <laughs> Chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Dance. And if you can't dance, I mean, some of us, like, our bodies are going, Ugh, pain, oh, I got to You just dance in your heart. That's just as good. Even if you can't dance physically, it doesn't matter. Dance in your heart. And that's called dancing also. It says that in Lord Chaitanya's Kirtan. Some, some were not dancing, but they were dancing in their minds and their hearts. But if you can dance physically, it's better for everybody. <laughs> Actually, you know, one of the reasons why the body is so painful is because we don't dance. <laughs> <laughs> I have this bad knee, I mean really bad, but when I dance, it feels good. <laughs> it goes away when I dance. And then when I, when I stop dancing later on, it comes back again. So I'm thinking, is this knee really bad or what? <laughs> so, you know, you, it's, dancing is just like a whole different thing. It's transcendental. And the last thing, I know everyone likes this one, prashad. <laughs> Take prashad, transcendental foodstuffs in so many wonderful varieties. So that's Lord Chaitanya's movement. It's really not that hard. <laughs> Singing, dancing, and eating. People have to, they go to nightclubs, they get intoxicated so they can get rid of all of their inhibitions. So they, then they start dancing and then they eat all kinds of bad things <laughs> and get sick. But we, when we chant and dance and eat prasadam, we feel happy. And well, what's the result? You actually be developing love of God. This process of hearing, singing, chanting, dancing and eating is a basic thing of activities, but actually when done in kirtan, in glorification of the Lord, in association with other devotees, you're actually awakening the love of God. It's amazing. It's, it's, the, it's what is called the higher taste. We get that higher taste, the sweetness from Krishna's holy name. And Lord Chaitanya says, just chant, dance, take prasadam, and serve the Vaishnavas, that's all. And when we chant and dance nicely, we're inspired to serve the Vaishnavas. That's the thing. The inspiration to serve others comes from the holy name. It actually comes from the holy name. And that inspiration brings about great satisfaction to Krishna when Krishna sees where we're serving his devotees and singing and dancing and eating nice Krishna prasadam. That's the process of Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada mentions that so many times. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, in Bhagavatam, in his lectures, he sums it up. This is the essence of Krishna consciousness. Sing, dance, eat prasadam, and associate with others doing the same thing. <laughs> that is the essence. Am we going too far? Is Radhanath Maharaj come yet? No? 
Not yet. Is there anyone who would like to ask some questions? Is there any questions? I was thinking I spoke long enough. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question? No questions. I can speak some more if you want, but if you have a question. There's a question over there. Oh. Oh. Be careful how you scratch your head. It looks like a question. <laughs> Ah, Mother Sukhava. Oh, Mother Sukhava. She is a very dear disciple of Srila Prabhupada. Coming from New Vrindavan, coming from the West, all she, she also spent much time in Vrindavan Dham. And she likes to serve devotees. Mother Sukhava. Do we have a microphone that we can... This is for the benefit of the greater audience that we don't see. Thank you. When you were talking about in the beginning of your um, speech about how sometimes the Lord was serving Jiva Goswami and sometimes the Lord comes and serves the devotees and you were saying that the devotees you know, we don't want Krishna to serve us, we want to serve Krishna. But I'm sure everybody has had an experience where Krishna did something for them. Isn't it that when Krishna serves us, he kind of like touches our heart and maybe even humbles us just by his service? Yeah, and there's always benefit on all levels. <laughs> touches our heart, he inspires us. He gives us faith, but this is the mood of the Goswamis, but actually Prabhupada env takes, takes that statement and, and says, generally, a devotee's, I guess the feeling is a mixed feeling, there's a kind of embarrassment that is mixed with a kind of joy. And Sanatana Goswami mildly chastised Rupa Goswami. It wasn't like he was like, oh, you did a mistake, you know. But he says the, the mood is that a Vaishnav doesn't want to accept service from the Lord. He thinks how to serve the Lord. But if the Lord, and the Lord is always thinking how to serve his devotees in different ways. In fact, the Lord is always doing that in one form or another. The more sensitive we are, the more introspective we are, the more we can see that what we're really doing, or trying to do, is really coming by the grace of the Lord. So he's making the arrangements. <laughs> it's like that old statement, what can the Ganges, what can those who are worshiping Ganges with Ganges water offer to the Ganges? You take Ganges water, you offer prayers to the Ganges with the water and you offer the water back to the Ganges. So Ganga Mata, she's not benefited by getting her water back. <laughs> But you're benefited by offering the prayer. So Krishna is supplying whatever we need, including the intelligence to carry out the service. He's also implying. The, so everything ultimately is coming from Krishna. Everything. But then sometimes Krishna even goes further and actually does something beyond what he normally does. He'll make some special arrangement for the devotee so the devotee can feel satisfied and happy. Or to, to somehow or other let the devotee know that he's accepting the devotee's service. So that's Krishna. <laughs> Thank you. Any other, anyone else? Yes, question. 
And then over there with the microphone. Keep going back. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for your wonderful class, Maharaj. Hare you mentioned Krishna. about brother of Radhanath Swami Maharaj. Can you see him? Can, I didn't catch the last word. Uh, we want to see him. You want to what? Uh, see him. You want to see Radhanath Maharaj's brother. Are you? He has transcendentally disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe if you pray hard enough, he'll transcendentally reappear. <laughs> I have no control over these things. <laughs> I have no control over anything, but at least I think I have some control over something. <laughs> so he's here. I met him, actually, when I first joined the Hare Krishna movement in 1973 in Nuvrindavan. He was there with, with Radhanath Maharaj. They were both there. Um, I met them both together. That was in 1973 in Nuvrindavan when I first came. So, so. There's a presentation for Govardhan Eco Village. Govardhan Eco Village presentation. So that will precede anything else that we have. So we begin now. This is on video. Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki This is a village, Eco Village presentation. Would you like to speak more about what's going to happen? Oh, okay. okay. Larry. Okay. Hare Krishna. So we have a very brief and uh, interesting presentation on the Vada project, which is known as the Govardhan Eco Village. Most of you probably have heard about it, heard lots of it, but <clears throat> we, since we've now completed the phase one, we were asked to bring it to the uh, attention and to your likely future use of the village. And I've been asked to make a few remarks and a few presentation before Krishna Prabhu takes the main gist of the presentation. So, yeah. the yeah, if you look at the 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 why the need was there of the seven purposes of Iskon that Srila Prabhupada laid down as really cast in lines of stone. Um, the sixth one is to bring the members closer together for the purpose of teaching a simpler and more natural way of life. So it was at the heart of one of the key aspects of Srila Prabhupada's uh, mission to also practically teach a simpler lifestyle. Next. And therefore the vision based on that purpose was laid down by His Holiness Radhana Swami Maharaj, living in respect for Mother Earth, Bhumi Devi, who is the consort of Varadev and honoring her and living in the ways that replenish her resources 
rather than exploit them and utilize whatever resources she gives us by her grace for the service of Lord Vishnu. Next. So specifically, <coughs> the purpose for this uh, project twofold. One is to present a sustainable community model. The important word here is sustainable because it's not something which we have to demonstrate over a so this will be a, a project for this uh, for this um, era and uh, beyond. So it has to last for hundreds of years and also to educate people in the field of traditional sciences including spirituality, cow protection, yoga and Ayurveda. Next. Now, before we come to where it is, just a very quick snapshot. We won't go into detail right now, but it has a Gaushala, it has a farm community. It also has social development issues, rural education, rural outreach. That means uh, come, uh, linking up with the villages nearby. Alternative energy, organic farming, cottage industry, and uh, natural buildings. Next. Okay, this is about three hours from here. One second. In Maharashtra, it's in uh, Pal uh, Palga district, about 110 kilometers from Mumbai and 220 kilometers on, from Surat. So it's uh, on the exactly on the Bombay Ahmedabad highway. Okay, this is the Govardhan Eco Village. So, if you go from the highway go towards them, and then there is this turning, it's about 10 kilometers from this point going to Govardhan Village, about 3 kilometers here and then 7 here. So, it's not too far, just about <coughs> 15 minutes off the main highway. This is another snapshot of the overall site. Um, This is a, a detail, I think. Yeah, these are the broad objects. Can you next? Yeah. So it gives an overview of. No, leave it. Then. Yeah. It gives an overview of what is ready now. Uh, there's the temple, uh, the reception, nursery, private cottages, the communal cottages amenities. These are all ready now. The Vrindavan forest, there's going to be about six acres for developing the 12 Vrindavan forest, which will come up a little later, maybe in phase three, I think. Um, the temple is yet to come up actually, that uh, also will start next year. And uh, the Gaushala, where also the work will be starting in a month or so. There's also the boating pool here, which has uh, one crore uh, liter capacity of water. Next. These are the broad facilities, uh, eco-friendly cottages, amenities, building, which includes auditorium, seminar hall, conference rooms, yoga shala, Ayurvedic wellness center, a boating pond, swimming pool, nursery, adventure sports for children, reception building, organic store. Um, when I, when we went here about a month ago, you know, my feeling was that many things that are usually offered, some things are ready, but some things which are not ready also, they slip it, you know, to tell you, okay, it's there. But I can tell you all of this is there and it is beyond our expectations, uh, I can honestly say. This part is done, almost all of it. Uh, uh, like for instance, the cottages, some of it is done, some will be done phase two, but yes. So at this stage, I invite uh, Krishnanam Prabhu to take over and complete the rest. Hare Krishna. So, we'll have a few, sorry. Yeah, yeah.
In fact, based on uh, Chandramoli, Ch based on Chandramoli Maharaj's request, um, you know they had just left. Uh, Larry, uh, Radhanath Swami's brother. <laughs> so he came back. Actually, uh, virtually out of the temple, he came back just to so that he can meet all of you. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Larry, come and sit up here. Um, that's okay. I don't deserve such a place of honor, but thank you. Uh, hello. hello. I'm Radhanath's younger brother. And I've heard for many, many years about his pastimes in India. <laughs> And I'm finally here. So I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> and now that I'm here, I get to meet such wonderful people, and my hosts have been beyond extraordinary. And I get to actually see and feel and touch and breathe some of the work that my brother has done. And it is quite remarkable. And just like you, I'm humbled at his lotus feet. I really only have a few minutes because my secretaries here have so much lined up for me. I wish I could stay forever. Alas, that's not to be, but hopefully I'll be back soon. But uh, I did spend my life, from the moment I was born, I knew Radhanath Swami. <laughs> Is this being recorded? Great. More evidence against me. Of course, I didn't know he was Radhanath Swami when I was born. And he, when he was born, he didn't know it either, I don't think. <laughs> I knew him as Richie, and perhaps you know that, I don't know. If I'm giving anything away that he doesn't want me to give away, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> but uh, as children, we shared the same bedroom for 12 years, and we've gotten to a lot of mischief together. We weren't stealing butter, but we were doing things similar. <laughs> In America, there's other things to do. <laughs> Equivalent. We were stealing margarine. No, I'm kidding. Anyway. But we really, you know, just briefly, we shared a, a lovely childhood together, and we, we grew into adulthood. And, and uh, at a formative age, back in the, in the 60s in America, of course, people of our generation started to seek out alternative ways of looking at existence and spiritual paths and so it was for my brother and for me and we studied uh, meditation together we spent many many hours and weeks and months and years meditating together and discussing different philosophies and then at a certain point him and his friend Gary who I've known for almost since I was born not quite they went on the journey that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Did you all read The Journey Home? Yeah. I'm in it, you know. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I was always interested in the spiritual path as well, but I think he was a little more serious than I was. And so he disappeared for a long, long time, and we all missed him because, well, especially me because he was my big brother, and I missed his companionship, and I missed his influence uh, I'm a musician actually by trade and he influenced me greatly in a variety of music that he loved and he seemed to gravitate towards music that spoke of the downtrodden uh, the blues and such such music as that and part of the reason I do what I do now is because of that influence from 
from my brother. And he finally returned. And uh, there's a song, when he came back to America after all these adventures and after finding Prabhupada and Krishna in this lovely country of yours, he came back to, when, when he came back, we were living in Miami Beach. And there is a very popular song in America that was recorded by a great singer named Tony Bennett. It's called, I Left My Heart in San Francisco. Well, apparently my brother left his heart in India. <laughs> so when he came home, the only logical place for him to go was New Vrindavan in the mountains of West Virginia. So he went there and then I went there and I followed him and we lived on top of a mountain at the isolated farm where very few other devotees were because we loved the beauty and the quiet and the isolation. And he uh, taught me a bit about how to care for the deities and this and that and uh, we read the Gita and all kinds of lovely things. I milked a few cows. But alas, my path took me elsewhere, but we're still very close as brothers. We always will be. And, uh, and now you're his brothers as well and sisters.